As odd and funny as this may sound, one of the most treasured and nostalgic memories that many early League of Legends players hold from the game's past is the rating system that Riot used to use to rank its player base. It was called ELO rating, which was originally invented for the world of chess in the 1960s, where to summarize how it works briefly, it's essentially a four-digit rating that's meant to assess a player's average skill. A new player's rating starts off at 1,000 ELO, where this number will then go up with a player winning matches or naturally go down with them losing. When it was first introduced, it was a really cool new standardized way to rank players and measure skill through just a few simple formulas, although it's a pretty commonplace thing in the world of competitive events nowadays. A version of the ELO system was used in League of Legends for its first two seasons to rank solo queue players, which is where many terms like ELO Hell originally come from. But what makes ELO interesting, and the reason I'm talking about it today, is theoretically a player's ELO rating could go up forever. There is no ultimate goal that you try to reach in the ELO system, like Challenger or something like that. All you have is a number that can always go up and down no matter where you are on a ranked ladder and is always comparable to everyone else and all their numbers. It's harder to increase the higher you climb, but there's technically no limit to how high this rating can go and in League's early history, there was one player who became known for completely breaking this rating system and solo queue along with it. Today, we're going to tell his story, but first... Today's video is sponsored by DraftBuff, the saviors of fantasy esports. Fantasy sports is one of my personal favorite things to do every sports season, as it's one of the most enjoyable ways to give you more reasons to root for teams and players beyond what you already follow. But League of Legends has sadly lacked a really good traditional fantasy scene ever since Riot took down the old LCS one. Thankfully, DraftBuff has brought it back. On their website today, you can create a new League of Legends fantasy league featuring LCS, LEC, or LC players, gather all your friends or find new ones online to play against, and you're ready to get started. You can play from your desktop or the handy mobile apps on iOS and Android where you'll find all the usual fantasy settings to customize your league, set when trade deadlines will be, waiver wires, and adjust how you want to score everything. Then after that, it's time to draft your team. There's a lot of great resources and advice to help you with decision making in the app itself. My advice would be to take as many Afrika Freaks players as you can since, after all, the Afrika Freaks are the best team in the world. You can check the description box down below for links to start playing today. And thank you again to DraftBuff for sponsoring this video. I really recommend you guys go check them out. It's a genuinely good product that's free to play as well. I probably should have mentioned that. But anyway, back to our video. So as I mentioned before, the interesting part about ELO rating is it can go up forever, but it's really hard to increase beyond a certain point. In chess, the highest ELOs in history achieved by anyone are in the mid to upper 2800s, the current record being held by Magnus Carlsen with a rating he got in 2014. What makes it so difficult to break these records is the higher your rating goes, the less ELO you gain with each subsequent win. How much rating you gain or lose after a match in the ELO system is determined by the rating of the opponent you're playing against. So if you're playing against someone who's higher rated than you are, you will gain more rating with wins and lose less rating with losses than if you're just facing someone who's equal to your rating. But if you're the highest ranked player there is, rank one, that means literally everyone else is a lower ELO than you are. And in your matches, if you win, you'll be gaining fewer and fewer rating while every loss racks you up huge ELO deficits. This means while theoretically ELO doesn't have any limits, in practice there is a sort of barrier that's unfeasible to expect anyone to go beyond. And in early seasons of League of Legends, a lot of people were really interested in trying to figure out where that barrier was. We have a little bit of documentation for what some of the highest ELOs ever were when Ranked was first released on the European server 
server in 2010. For the first couple of months of play, players hit a bit of a brick wall at the 1700 range before eventually breaking through that, making it to the 1900s a month later. One month after that, we saw the first player ever, Yellowstar, hit 2000 ELO in December of 2010. Yellowstar was actually the first player ever to reach 2100 and 2300 rating as well, although the top laner Wicked was the first player to ever hit 2200. This is significant since Wicked was the first player to ever reach Platinum, the highest rating when Solo Q was first released, which you had to get an ELO of 2225 to achieve in Season 1. When Wicked first got to Platinum, his team at the time, SK Gaming, published an article announcing his achievement, which included a bit of a snapshot of some of the highest ratings in both North America and Europe, which were the only servers active. As Season 1 progressed throughout 2011, players continued trying to push that boundary of how high they could make their ratings go. It seemed as though Poe Belter eventually broke 2500 ELO before losing it shortly after on June 21st, 2011, which was at a time when all the other pro players in League of Legends were off competing at the Season 1 World Championship in Sweden. It's not 100% clear if he was the first player ever to reach 2500, but this benchmark of 2500 ELO was eventually considered a sort of limit, a kind of goal for most players to aspire to as the highest echelon reasonably accomplishable. By the end of Season 1 and 2, only two players in North America managed to finish with this rating, Big Fat GG and Voiboy, who ended the season at rank 1, getting 2,550 ELO. In Europe, only a single player ended the season with this accomplishment, as Yellow Pete finished rank 1 in that region. Now at the time, it really seemed like this was as high as you could go. Only a few players could ever touch these ratings, and not many others came all that close. In the main regions, you had a pretty steep drop off from the 2,500 players and just everyone else below them, and this is only on North America and Europe West as well. If you look at some of the smaller servers, like EU, Nordic, and East or Southeast Asia, you can see players weren't able to get all that close to 2,500 rating at the time. We might have just reached the limit of ELO in League of Legends, but there was one player who thought that it could go further. When Season 1 ended and Season 2 began, Riot gave everyone's rating a soft reset, meaning the top players would have to climb back up if they wanted to try and push any more boundaries. Within a month, in December of 2011, a lot of top EU players were already back in the 2200 range again, but a few new faces also started popping up here and there. Players like Young Buck, Yamato Cannon, and a young Danish mid laner named Bjergsen started showing up alongside the old established pros. But then, at the start of February, a 17-year-old German kid named Lord would crack the top 25. Real name Karl Lukman, Lord was a mid laner who had been playing League since beta and had reached some really impressive ratings already at this point in his career. At the end of Season 1, he had managed to finish with 2300 ELO in the top 10 of European players, which was really high up there, but in Season 2, he seemingly wanted more. By April, April of 2012, he was already back in the top 10 and had managed to hit 2500 rating, that limit that most people believed was as far as most players could go. But by late April, Pharrellin Lord Kerp and a player named Solo Gasong had broken the 2600 ELO barrier, the first players to ever reach that rating. At this point, Pharrellin Lord was already able to achieve a goal that many top stars dreamt of, becoming a professional as he was signed to be the mid laner for team alternate. Naturally, he started scrimmaging with his team, doing organized fives practice, and attending tournaments, but what made him interesting as a player was he kept on playing solo queue as if he was trying to get his big break still. By May 1st, Pharrellin Lord had managed to climb all the way up to rank 1 and was now knocking on the door of 2700 ELO. That was incredible. Not many people thought we could go past 2500, but on May 5th, Pharrellin Lord went 200 above that 
breaking everything and becoming the first player ever to reach 2700 rating. What made this story so interesting was Pharrell and Lord chose a really hard path for himself when doing this. Other players who made the top 25 would normally just start making smurf accounts at that point so they could sit with their main and high ELA with an impressive rank while still getting to play more league. I mean, at a certain point, you have way more to lose than to gain by continuing to play on a main account. You have longer queue times, less ELO with wins, bigger losses when you fall, and if you're rank one with an ELO higher than literally everyone else in the game's history, there is no logical reason to keep playing. By late May, Pharrell and Lord was knocking on the door of 2800 ELO, which was absolutely insane. He wasn't making a smurf. He wasn't content relaxing and just living the life of a professional League of Legends player. He kept on going with a vigor that other players marveled at. I don't have a girlfriend, and if I would, she has to understand what I am doing and that I can't afford that much time for her. Like a madman, he continued on this righteous quest to push the boundaries of what was possible, which he would do again on June 1st of 2012. Then he would be the first player ever to reach 2800 ELO as well. I know I'm throwing a lot of numbers at you with this story, and it may be tough to grasp what's going on, but take a second to think about what's happening here in relation to another solo queue star that you're all probably well aware of, Apto or Dopa. Apto is the infamous Korean League of Legends mid laner who might be the best solo queue player of the modern era of LOL. He was so good at climbing in solo queue that he eventually turned into an infamous ELO booster that was banned by Riot for 1,000 years, which is sort of a subject for another video. But what you should know about him in relation to this story is he chose to not go pro because he could make more money ELO boosting. If you're the best solo queue player in the world, World. You can do a lot to cash in on that. You can stream your matches to thousands of viewers, create guides on how to climb, leverage your success to go pro yourself, or just boost other people's accounts for insane money. That's what the current best solo queue player is doing. Now look at Pharrell and Lord. He was the best solo queue player of all time, up until season two at least. He has achieved successes that nobody else has ever done before, and is one of the most well-known and famous names in the League of Legends community. And what does he do with it? He plays professionally on an average team, he makes no guides or sponsored paid endorsements, he doesn't even make a smurf to make streaming easier on himself, and he actually hardly streams at all. He just keeps on playing solo queue, not at all interested in the fame or fortune of being so good at League. It's like he was born for this grind, continuing to do so even when he's gaining 6 elo per win and losing 18 elo every loss. He's waiting through 1 hour queue times to even find a game and really has nothing to gain by doing this. He's not making a lot of money. He's broken every record and expectation anyone could have. He's already the best solo queue player, period. There's no reason for him to continue climbing, but he's still climbing. Just over one month later, sometime in early August, Pharrell and Lord would hit 2,900 ELO, not just significant as another record he broke, but now he's breaking records in other games. At this point, he might not just be the highest rated player in league ever, but he could very well be the highest rated player in any competitive game that has ever measured skill with ELO. Insanity. The League of Legends community was astonished at this accomplishment again, but now the question had to be asked, was 3,000 possible? Well, if you know this story, you know the answer to that. One month later, on September 19th, 2012, Pharrell and Lord reached 3,000 ELO, the highest rating ever in the history of League and the only player to ever do so. By the time he was toward the end of this grind, he was gaining 3 or 4 rating per win while losing 20 rating with each loss. He was sitting through two hour queue times and had begun getting hit with DDoS attacks in the few times he was getting in games, disconnecting him consistently. In fact, in the very last game where he hit 3000 ELO, he spent half the match DC'd unable to play, 
but still found a way to win. It was just a year ago that players thought 2,500 was the limit, but this little German kid who was now only 18 years old shattered that belief. Nobody ever came close to this rating again as Raya would retire the ELO system next season, maybe because Pharrell and Lord completely destroyed it. When later asked in an interview about how he reached 3,000 rating, Pharrell and Lord simply responded, I achieved it by playing solo queue. I have no secret, I just play. I don't flame my teammates, at least I try not to. As impressive as all this was, I bet Pharrell and Lord wanted just as much success in his professional career as he had in solo queue up until this point. He'd sadly not have the most eventful pro career at first, as his team alternate wouldn't ever take a title in seasons one or two. After some time, he eventually decided to leave the team and started up a new squad appropriately named Team Elo Blade. This team would manage to have a few impressive performances, most notably the ESL Major Series 10, where they would have a great bracket run that included a 2-0 sweep of Moscow 5 on their way to grand finals. Coincidentally, Elo Blade would then get sponsored by Alternate again before grand finals where they would sadly lose their final series to Fnatic, two games to zero. After season two when the LCS era began, Alternate tried to qualify for the EU LCS 2013 spring split, but sadly would be given a really tough road to do so as they would be put in a sort of group of death for their qualifying. Fire. They only had three best of ones they got to play in this group where they would fall short losing to Fnatic and a team named Giants getting eliminated with no chance of playing in spring. During spring split, Pharrell and Lord would still make his LCS debut when he subbed in for the team Copenhagen Wolves a couple of times in place of their other two mid laners, Kautard and Bjergsen. But Pharrell and Lord would stay with alternate and still had a chance to qualify for the 2013 EU summer split. The team would make it to the live offline promotional series where the last hurdle they'd have to face was a demoted EU LCS squad that they would be battling for a spot in the following split who just happened to be Giants Gaming, one of the squads that had knocked them out of contention of the previous promotion tournament. A best of five between these two teams would now decide who got to make it to the 2013 summer split. The series started off heavily in favor of Giants Gaming, who took the first two games with relative ease, but Alternate managed to hold out and eventually rode Pharrell and Lord's Nidalee, who would carry them from mid lane to make a comeback, keeping the series alive. They'd then ride that wave of momentum into Game 4 with another victory to tie the series up two games to two, sending the squads into a final Game 5 winner-take-all match to determine who got to play in the LCS. That final match started off incredibly rough for Alternate again, as they would fall behind six kills to one relatively early on. Eventually, they would start to claw their way back in kills, although Giants still had a 10k gold lead that they kept for almost the entire game game. After stalling out the match for a while, Alternate eventually decided to try and sneak a Baron at the 50 minute mark, which Giants caught vision of and then started to force a team fight. If Giants won this fight here, there was a very real chance that was the end of the game, the end of the series, and Pharrell and Lord would be out of LCS. But then Pharrell and Lord did this. It's going to be alternate possibly starting it off. We're going to see the teleport though. They're going in towards Pharrell and Lord. They're going to put a lot of damage down on towards him. Power Knight back brave. up towards Exterman. It is very, very brave. It's going to be Aaron Oyen that's going to pay for it with his life. He goes down. There's going to be ultimate. It's a great ultimate. Jamie gets caught down. What? He's shot. Wave catches. Oh, my. Members of Giants there. Beautifully done. Jim Burns gets dropped. He's going to respawn. He's going to turn back around. He's firing off the arrows just like you can. Pharrell and Lord picks up the double kill. He's still in this one. He's going to turn it back around. It's a triple kill. The 3000 ELO shockwave, where Pharrell and Lord caught the entire Giants roster, pulling them into a comboed rumble equalizer, one alternate this team fight gave them Baron and the victory 
Ferelin Lord was finally in LCS. This was one of the coolest moments in League history, to see a player who was essentially the Apto of Season 2 managing to claw his way into the highest level of competition gave a lot of people a ton of joy. Sadly, Alternate and Ferelin Lord would never win LCS and had a pretty average and brief time there before the roster broke up at the end of that 2013 summer split. Ferelin Lord was allegedly kicked from the team towards the end of the season as rumor had it he was coasting on his prior talent and wasn't 100% willing to put in the time to learn newer champions that were becoming meta. Shortly after he left alternate, Ferelin Lord would retire from pro play at the young age of just 19 years old. It was really sad to see such a great god of the game retire so early and to see his career fizzle out so fast. It wasn't long after he left that League began hitting much of its mainstream success, and in the modern climate of play where people worship solo queue gods like Apto, I mean, I could very easily see Ferelin Lord being one of those worshipped idols by fans if he just hit his peak talent a little bit later in League. But regardless of how his pro career may have ended, I think it's important we never forget who the original King of Ela was. As impressive as some of the modern gods of the grind are, I don't think any of them can really hold a candle to Ferelin Lord. He was a special player who did special things in the face of adversity at least in the sense that he didn't have to do any of this. This was such a tough thing for him to do, and he got very little benefit from choosing to do so, but he chose to do so anyway and performed incredible feats. Not only that, but unlike many solo queue stars of today, he also effectively translated his talent to the professional scene where even if it was for only a brief moment in history, he got to shine with his time in the limelight. He may have only been around for a few moments in history, but he left an incredible mark on this game with some insane accomplishments that deserve their moment in time, and I hope I did his story justice today. Thank you very much for watching.